Welcome to Westworld, where nothing can go wrong. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. We always try to do a looser summer theme, and to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Jurassic Park film, we've been doing a summer of Michael Crichton. And for our last look at Crichton's work, we are seeing what would happen if the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park were replaced by robots. That's right. Today we are talking about Westworld. All right. Well, I am going to be kind of kicking us off here for this episode here. As Mel said at the end of that introduction, we are talking about Westworld. And I'll be frank and say that I have actually not seen the TV show. So I'm going to be keeping my comments strictly based around the movie. I've heard good things about the show, but I have not seen it. Uh, I don't know if either of you have so if you want to you know throw in tidbits from the tv show by all means feel free but uh for those of you who didn't know that it was originally a movie because i think uh it's it's one of the more forgotten parts of michael crichton's filmography but uh it it was a movie from 1973 it starred yule brenner and uh james brolin and uh several other actors it was uh written by michael crichton and uh he wrote the original screenplay and directed it and uh it actually did have enough of a presence i guess that uh it spawned a sequel several years later in 1976 called future world there were also some um, other short uh short-lived attempts uh like a television show from the 1980s called beyond west world as well as the uh the HBO show from that started in 2016. And I believe it is over now. I think they did air the final season in 2022. Um, Also just about the movie itself. It was uh, nominated for a Hugo Nebula and Saturn awards and was uh, pretty well received by critics as well. And the basic story stop me if you've heard this before it's about an amusement park where something malfunctions and begins killing visitors in this case uh as as was mentioned in the intro it was robots instead of dinosaurs but i think there is a lot about the movie that does stand a little bit apart from jurassic park but there's definitely a lot of points in my notes that i took while watching this where i i have the phrase proto jurassic park or i can see how this could go to that and (laughs) referring to jurassic park so uh, i will do my best not to just sit and compare and contrast this movie with jurassic park but i mean a lot of the elements are there in a in a slightly different form and since we usually kind of give initial impressions i'll be forthright i had not seen this movie before i've seen several of the other film adaptations of michael crichton's works i've seen andromeda strain i've seen congo unfortunately i've seen sphere of course i've seen jurassic park plus unfortunately several of its sequels but this was one that i had never seen before uh, before we decided to include it here in this summer of crichton for the podcast and I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, there there are some some notes that I mentioned about the the idea of the technology from 1973 as to what the future would be like. It was very much rooted in 1973, but it's you know we 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 can't really fault something that is 50 years old for incorrectly predicting the future. But it was very interesting to see uh, some of that. But um, I had not seen it before this and. I, I really did enjoy it. I thought it was it was interesting. I expected to see more out of Yule Brenner since he is one of the bigger names attached to the movie. And he does have a big presence in the movie, but he doesn't do a lot 
it, 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 we can kind of dive into that. And he definitely barely has any speaking lines in the film. But uh, I, I, I think I enjoyed it. And um, I actually, one thing that I, I was noticing about this, and, and then I'll pass the baton over to Mel or Lisa, but uh, one thing that I noticed about this is that the movie was about 90 minutes on the mark like it was an hour and a half more or less and i feel like that was just the right amount of length for this movie it it's something i've been thinking about just about movies in general how over the last decade or so we've gone from a standard 90 minute running time to assuming it's going to be at least two hours or longer and i have no problem with that like i recently saw oppenheimer that needed to be three hours long but not everything does this movie would have floundered at two hours long, but 90 minutes, it was tight, it was compact, and it didn't drag. So uh, that's kind of my initial thoughts and impressions. Uh, do one of you want to jump in with, with yours? I guess I'll go next. Um, similar to you, Matt, I have not seen the HBO TV series and even though i mean I, I was aware of it, and I have not I had not watched the 1973 Westworld prior to this so i'm assuming unless lisa's watched the newer series and wants to throw some information about in there we're probably going to focus more on the 1973 movie and my thoughts are very similar to yours i enjoyed it i feel like it was the right length i very much i was noticing the jurassic park parallels as as you mentioned but like i think you also said it didn't take away from the film like at first when I was like, oh, there's a control room and there's people watching them go in in the cars and it started to like pull me out of it a little bit, which I understand this movie came out in 1973. So, you know, it, would, it should be the other way around. But I still, it was enough of a difference in premise that even though it's a similar amusement park built by people with a lot of money, I could go with it. And it's also, it's again, to belabor a point we talked about, even I think in the Andromeda strain as well, this is an amusement park that was built by people with money for people with money. In 1973, I'm sure the $1,000 a day people are paying to do this would have been a lot more than how we think of it now. One of the things that kind of stuck out to me was not just like the, I guess, danger of technology, which I'm sure we need to talk about. I thought it was disturbing in the very beginning when they're interviewing the people coming out and the one guy is like, I got to you know, play quote unquote cowboys and Indians for real. And I shot six people and it's like really excited. I was thinking to myself, what does it mean to feel like you realistically shot someone? I don't know. I just feel like there's some moral implications there that, you know, there was even some comedy in this movie. So I don't know how fully it was exploring that. But I also liked the, not just the technology, but also again, like Jurassic Park, we have this prototype for it of a warning against corporate greed not only is there all this money involved and people with means going to this amusement park, but we also have these moments where the people in charge are meeting and like, maybe we should do some safety things or shut down briefly. And they just won't, they just keep pushing it. And again, even though Jurassic Park was in the shakedown cruise and not going, it was a similar kind of, kind of thing. And so I thought it was interesting that he could do, two stories very kind of parallel to each other, but also with enough differences that it didn't bother me that these themes were, were repeating. And I too was kind of surprised that, um, well, basically, I mean, even though uh, Yul Brenner only had a few lines, but I guess his menace was his silence uh, aspect as the gunslinger, his pursuit at all costs to get people toward the end. Um, I also thought it was interesting. I don't know much about, I think his name is Richard Benjamin, who played Peter Martin, but he was kind of the main character. Whereas I think going into it, thinking back on the 70s, I was like, ah, oh, Yul Brenner is in this. That's a big name. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, Josh Brolin or James Brolin in this as well, who I guess I'm not sure where he was in his career in 1973. I can only, I find like myself only thinking about stuff in the past few years. Um, but yeah, I thought it was interesting that this other actor that I feel like I probably saw him in things was kind of a character actor and I didn't like automatically recognize him was our main guy that we were like following and kind of looking through his perspective at what was going on. So yeah, I guess those are just a few of my, a few of my thoughts. Lisa, 
what did you think about this movie? And did you watch the newer one since Matt and I have not? <laughs> I've been like sitting here trying to be quiet the whole time y'all are talking because I have seen the TV show, <laughs> the HBO series. And uh, oh man, you guys, you have to watch it. I'm going to try not to spoil anything. Although since you've seen the movie, it, I mean, you know, some of it. So I guess I, I will talk around what's there, but um, a few of the kind of, I think, differences. So I will say I haven't seen the sequel, the film sequel, Future World. I want to. I think that uh, when they were building up the uh, TV show for HBO, uh, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, who were the, I guess they were the co-showrunners on that, um, they took in kind of the entirety of Westworld's mythology. So they incorporated a lot from the first movie, but also from the second. And uh, I'm not sure if they looked into some of the other stuff, but I know like at least Westworld and Future World kind of both went into um, how they built it out. But uh, one major thing, and this is really, it was really interesting, I think, listening to you guys talk about this and kind of what you noticed in the film and kind of some things you were wondering about, knowing what I know <laughs> about the TV show. But I will say that they, the gunslinger is kind of reimagined to be this character called uh, the man in black. He is essentially kind of is the same archetype. I guess I'll say it for the gunslinger. He's played by Ed Harris in the TV show just fantastically. Um, and then there's also the, the guests who are there who you kind of have like the first time visitor to the place with a person who's gone quite a bit. And, and you have that, but the sh the TV show differs in a few ways. One is that that man in black kind of slash gunslinger character is really much more integral to the part. Now, he still has like the kind of silence and mystery about him that you guys were talking about. But it's funny that even even though I know you're you're attaching it to a to the fact that it was Yul Brenner and, you know, you were expecting maybe more. Um, I think they kind of play with that idea of this is supposed to be a character that we follow and they flesh it out in the TV show a lot more. Um, one thing that Mel, I was really interested in what you were talking about, cause I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on it, but how you kind of picked up on, I mean, of course there's the corporate greed, which is going to be there in, in this story. It, it's just like Jurassic Park and all that. It's just the kind of like, just because we can, should we, <laughs> of it all that, you know, a lot of Crichton stories really kind of follow. But when you had said, you, when you had picked up on the, the, the idea that this is kind of an examination of our human fascination with things like, sex and violence and what happens when those things become entertainment the tv show i feel like takes that little spark that's there in the movie and really explodes it because the tv show really is dealing with kind of the question of like what makes us human um because obviously we're dealing with robots here and the robots are part of the story much more. It, it's, it's much, I mean, it's still like a story of like robots malfunctioning, but you kind of learn that there's a specific reason like why they're malfunctioning, which I think is a little bit different than in a movie. And you, and you start to wonder about the ethics of things that are going on behind the scenes. You get a, you get a lot of the behind the scenes of like the researchers and Anthony Hopkins plays <laughs> plays like the head guy who dreams up everything and he's wonderful in this too like I uh, I can't even say it. so many good actors in the tv show you have you guys really have to watch it um 
Evan Rachel Wood plays one of the uh, robots. Santa Way Newton plays one of the robots. Then there's like the programming head played by Jeffrey Wright. It's just, it's so good. But it does, it kind of goes into the idea of like, what is it in us? Or what does it say about us as humans that we would kind of invent this technology and it and basically invent people to kill um because you're not just like killing somebody but they have these like complicated backstories and you know we want to make sure that we see them with their family and so it feels kind of tragic i, I don't know it's just like this whole storytelling aspect of of it too and and why we need to be immersed in that um so yeah it's it's i feel like the tv show takes the strands that were there in the movie but because it was like a 90 minute movie matt like like you were saying and it just kind of takes it and spreads it out over four seasons so it really gets to explore a lot of that in a really interesting way so that that will be what i say about the tv show and i'm hoping it's enough to like dangle a carrot in front of you and make you go watch it. <laughs> oh, it definitely has. And at least for, for me, <laughs> I, I, I won't speak for Mel here, but uh, that, that definitely intrigues me. And I've had it recommended to me by, by some other friends in the past, but it's one of those ones that they mentioned it a while back and it's been a long time since it's even come up in conversation. So I had forgotten about the TV show that I haven't seen yet, but that really is intriguing uh what what you were saying about how it's it's exploring kind of what it is to be human but also why do humans why would we create an amusement park where we would go reenact things where we can kill people and have sex with whomever we want and that i mean that is something that like you said that's a thread that it really does not get expounded on in the movie but it's definitely there in the movie and I mean, we we see pretty much all of the guests that I can think of. Well, most of the guests, at least, in some way, are are exploiting the robots, be it for violence, be it for sexual gratification, be it for something. Um, that it, they're definitely. I mean, it, it's that idea of I, I guess that these are robots that that are I guess. They, they don't have to give consent to be killed or and I, so I don't have to be ba feel bad for it. They don't have to give consent to, to have sex with, so I don't have to feel bad for it. And that was something that stood out to me watching this. Like I, I thought to myself, like, what does it say about these people that they're enjoying this? And so I really would like to, I, I think that sounds fascinating to really explore that over the, the, length of a tv series it's one of those things that i think if they tried to do it too much more than they did in the movie version here it would have dragged it down some because they wouldn't have been able to explore it as fully as it probably needs to be because these are like deep questions and the movie is already 90 minutes if you start really adding more pages like that i mean you're probably adding up what another 20 30 minutes onto it um but yeah, you know, you've you've sold me on the show. So I was actually while I was muted while you were talking, um, adding it into my queue over on uh, HBO Max or whatever it is this week that they call it. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, I, I'm definitely sold. And uh, well, Mel, do you want to chime in too? I uh sure. no that sounds really interesting that they would dive more deeply into that because i feel like that is kind of the the meaty kind of philosophical question of this and the thing that disturbed me i mean the corporate greed and the letting the people get hurt was disturbing i'm not saying it's not but the i think there's like a couple that goes in and you can tell that their desires are kind of conflicting with each other's let's say and there was just so much potential for this to go south in various ways. And yeah, like you were saying, Matt, the idea of creating a robot just to kind of service human beings' desires is 
is really kind of disturbing. Um, I thought it was, even though it's 90 minutes and it didn't go into that that much, one of the ways that I started thinking about this and write, making notes on it was with the Peter character who's never been there before. And the James Brolin character is like really cavalier about shooting the gunslinger and getting into fights and, you know, uh, being with the women and, and et cetera, et cetera. And Peter is uncomfortable in the beginning. He doesn't want to fight the gunslinger when the gunslinger is insulting him at first. Um, and he shoots him and then he's worried that he may hurt someone else. But of course you can't supposedly, which I wouldn't trust any of these safety features. Um, but then when they go and he's with the, the woman robot and he spends the night with her, he's uncomfortable with that. And it seems like gradually the more he does, the more he opens up to it. And I think you kind of see how, even if you're disturbed by this, that your inhibitions could lower the more you get into the situation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't have easy answers for it. And I think it's cool that the TV show delved into it more. Um, another thing I thought was interesting, and we can obviously go back to the philosophical question if we want to, but when I was looking through my notes earlier today, the science of it or the science fiction of it, I guess you would say was interesting to me. You're right, Matt. It doesn't, it's very 1970s. It's like being in the Andromeda strain labs, but at the same time, I thought it was interesting in this one scene where they were, so throughout the whole movie, stuff is breaking down. And this one scene where they're talking about it, they are the technicians and they don't understand what's happening. And they talk about how it's like a computer virus, which I think this is one of the first mentions of that in fiction. Because these breakdowns are doubling and they're spreading from world to world. So there's like Roman world and medieval world and West world. And they talk about how it's an outbreak pattern, which remind me of Andromeda strain. So um, they say at one point that they, they're having a hard time fixing them and they can't anticipate what's going to happen because, quote, they were designed by computers. We don't know exactly how they work. And I was like, what kind of a world is this that you allowed computers to create an amusement park that you run? Like, whose idea was this? And how did you create a robot? You don't even know how it works. And at one point, they talk about their robots using psychology. They're like, it's not just like they broke down like an automated thing, but there was a, quote, central mechanism of psychosis. And I know there is some bleeding back and forth in language. But at the same time, I thought it was interesting that there's this kind of hole in the middle of the movie that the scientists and technicians don't even know how to... <laughs> handle these things and so there's almost the implication that it's not even a mechanical problem i don't know i mean it was almost like you could read into it the possibility that the robots are gaining some sort of sentience or something because they say at one point there's nothing wrong with one of them they just quote refuse to follow their programming and that in 90 minutes can't be followed up on either but that really got me well mel i'm so glad you mentioned that quote because i literally transcribed that quote as well in my notes um i i, I had that I exact kind of thought that that idea of some of these were designed by computers we don't even know exactly how they work was like it when it first happened it sort of stunned me but then like the more i thought about it i mean we're on the precipice of that right now in our world and this is not Matt putting on a tinfoil hat and becoming a doomsayer here. But, I mean, if you've used chat GPT or any of those other um, AI language models, one of the uses that people are using them for, like as we speak now, is computer coding. They are, you know, having the AI language models write the computer code for programs that they are programming. And I don't think it's that big of a leap to say that at some point it may get to the point where we don't fully understand the code because it's so far, we're so far removed from it that the AI has taken over it. And I'm, I'm not insinuating that, you know, that's going to cause machines to kill us all or whatever, but just that we could end up in a spot like Westworld here where the, the AI chat gpt whatever you want to call it is writing that source code for something like an android or something something similar that we understand but don't fully know the 
full workings of because we don't we, we've removed ourselves from that process so much that no one specializes in, in it any longer uh, i mean it's kind of like i'm trying to think of a good example for it but um well i i can't think of a good example i'm not i'm, I'm not thinking on my toes tonight <laughs> but uh i mean i i really do think that I mean, I'm not going to say in the next five, ten years, but I mean, within our lifetimes, we could reach a point where something like that is feasible, that we're creating, manufacturing, distributing, living amongst some sort of um, something that's been designed more by the computer than by us in terms of like the base operating systems and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, like that, that was kind of what jumped out to me about that, but also... The flip side of that is it felt to me sort of exactly like what Ian Malcolm points out in Jurassic Park, where he says, you know, you, you're you playing God here, messing with things that you don't even fully understand. And that was kind of like, I, I saw that in Westworld, especially with that particular line about the, the robots. Um, because, like they're breaking down and pe they, they don't even fully understand why because they don't even fully understand the robots themselves and so when they do something like kill the power which should kill the power to the robots it doesn't do anything because they have some sort of battery backups and are able to draw from that longer than they anticipated things like that so anyway um I guess if if you take anything from that slightly rambling comment, we should we should understand the technology that we're we're dealing with, rather than entrusting uh, uh, androids or computers, and assuming that they'll do best. I completely agree. Um, I mean, as you're talking, I'm making my tinfoil hat right now to put on. Um, <laughs> no, but I. I think this is one of the reasons that science fiction is such a fascinating genre for me. And, that, and I'm so glad that we're talking about the original film and what it did in science fiction, um, because a lot of people, you know, of course, talk about the HBO show, like, you know, that it's still recent enough, I think, in people's memories that. When you say Westworld, that's what is going to pop up in their head. But the fact that these were some of the issues that were being discussed in 1973, I've seen it pointed out that this was one of the first pieces of like fiction that dealt with the idea of a computer virus, like as as we kind of understand it. Um, I don't know that for sure because honestly I didn't have the time or the bandwidth to really dig that deeply into the research for this, but I can't off the top of my head think of one that was earlier. So if it's not the first, it's one of the first, it's one of the earliest ones I think that dealt with that kind of like, um, kind of technology that can malfunction in such a way that uh, we can't really contain it or control it. And at the beginning of this episode, Matt, you had mentioned that this was nominated for a Hugo, a Nebula, and a Saturn. Like, that has pretty much all the big <laughs> science fiction awards um, that it could be nominated for. And I think that's largely to do with the fact that it was so cutting edge. Like, it's easy for us now, where we're sitting in 2023, to look at it and say, well, this is just Jurassic Park with <laughs> robots. Uh, you know, because it does, I mean, obviously, like, Crichton, he's returning in Jurassic Park to a lot of the things that he did explore in this and, you know, things that he likes as um, a writer, you know, because it does say something about why we as humans like to play God when clearly we shouldn't, when everything points to, like, reasons we shouldn't do that. But we like to. We like to have that all-controlling power. We like to have the either the real power over life or death or the perceived power over life or death as in this case and we will do it if we have something that we like we will exploit it 
for like our own greed and our own amusement. And like, that's just a kind of a gross way of looking at humanity, but it's something that he's exploring obviously through all of this. But I do kind of want to, again, kind of point out that this was in 1973 that we were, that he's exploring some of these like very early issues of what can really go wrong with technology if we're not careful um, and we're not kind of good stewards of it. And if we're messing with stuff, we don't understand because I think, again, I'm not going to say anything about the TV show because it does go into some of the things that you're (laughs) talking about and it explores it much more in depth. So I'm just not going to say anything, but uh, I do think Matt, that your connection to like the AI issues of today that we're seeing, you know, there's always kind of the joke and the worry today that like what happens when AI becomes self-aware and doesn't need humans anymore. Um, But I think maybe more than that being a kind of concern, it's, it's exactly what you're saying is that we will use the technology we have to write more advanced technology. And then what happens when we don't fully understand it anymore? Like what happens when we have to rely upon the programming to explain it to us? It's, that's a scary thought. Um, And it's fascinating to me that it was being, it was being uh, explored and introduced in 1973. I mean, you know, we grew up in a time when I like, you know, my kids now don't know what a dial tone is on a phone. <laughs> like that's how far technology has advanced just in our lifetimes. And like, yes, we had computers growing up, but they weren't like they were today. But even like before that in 73 to be, ex- you know, anticipating is the word I'm looking for here to be anticipating these problems with technology. I think it's just fascinating. And I, that's why I'm I'm just really glad we're looking at it and, and we're kind of taking a look at really what Michael Crichton was doing here with this. Um, It's, it's really fascinating. I agree. And I, I forget how forward thinking Michael Crichton was and, and, and especially I forget how long his career was as well. I came to him via Jurassic Park, and I was not alive in 1973. And so I always kind of equate him more with the 90s because he had that huge run of popularity in part due to Jurassic Park, both the book and the movie. Uh, The movie did so well that, of course, they licensed other other adaptations of earlier works like like sphere and congo and and probably several others that i'm not thinking of off the top of my head and that might just be um a result of my age i guess and when i discovered him that i kind of more equate him with the 90s than the 70s and 80s but i mean as you were talking i was sitting there thinking they're going i mean 1973 we're recording this in 2023 so i mean it is literally 50 years ago that's half a century and while while the technology that they used at the time to to i guess mimic what they think the future would look like was not right a lot of the ideas were or are starting to come true and for someone to be able to predict that, I mean, obviously we're not going to be able to predict exactly how technology itself is going to go. I have no idea what technology is going to be like in 50 years. We'll probably have it, you know, screens embedded in our eyes or something, who knows. But the overarching philosophical, ethical questions and, and even the what happens when we get to a point where the the technology is less of a tool that we know and instead becomes a tool that we don't fully understand. I mean, that's really deep. (laughs) And uh, 
and like you said lisa too i mean the idea of a con computer virus was i mean one thing that I, I had to remind myself while i was watching this was that in 1973 there was no such thing as the internet like it just didn't exist there may have been the beginnings of it that started with the military for communicating but i mean it wasn't widely known it was it was classified at the time it was not something that people would really be thinking of so the idea of machines communicating with each other and spreading something like a virus he thought of that without even knowing like having the touchstone of what it of what the internet is as a way of spreading that disease and that that was one thing that i did mention in my notes while watching this that i wished that they had developed a little more or expanded on it a little more was the, the 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 origins of the breakdown because i liked that the the technicians didn't understand it but there were still it, it still felt like a little nebulous to me as to what the breakdown exactly was the robots were malfunctioning and some of them were well all of them really were killing humans but there was no reason for it i guess but what they did really well was how the the breakdown would replicate like a spreading like a virus a computer virus i mean that's become such a common thing that we just don't even i mean if you don't have antivirus software on your computer right now um first of all you're crazy uh at least if you have windows but second of all you know that you should i mean just even the idea of a computer virus is so ingrained in our culture now because of the internet Crichton didn't have that in 73 and he still was able to predict that which is kind of awesome yeah I agree yeah I mean everything that you were saying I don't know that I can add anything else I was also thinking the same thing that this is 50 years and you know we we have a story that is solid enough in looking forward to the future that it could then be built upon again in like 2016 with the new version. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about that with the Andromeda strain, the idea of like um, looking toward the future and kind of extrapolating, you know, what could happen based on where we are now and what you think may not exactly happen. Like you said, Matt, I don't want screens embedded in my eyes personally, but um, <laughs> we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but you can imagine the possibilities. And I think it's those philosophical questions that we've been talking about that make this work. Because if you posit these things that could happen, you don't have to explain exactly how it would work. You just posit that it's a possibility. And I think it's interesting that we're kind of seeing those possibilities now. One other thing I wanted to mention, I don't know how much you want to go into this, but you know, we did a series on robots and we talked about the Uncanny Valley and you definitely have that working here too. Um, I thought it was, it was interesting that he kind of played with the idea of the Uncanny Valley and the idea of it making this fantasy world for them to play in. You know, the Brolin character at one point says this really disturbing thing that I had to write down that it's as real as anything else when the the main guy, Peter, is just like, is this real? You know, because he doesn't, under, you know, he it's like, we can do whatever we want, basically. And, and the Brolin character is like, yes, you could do whatever you want. It's as real as anything else. And that kind of idea of something being so close to reality, it's almost like you can't pull it apart. It's fascinating. It's 1973. There's these places can't even be big enough to do what they're thinking they're going to do. I mean, that's where you need 21st century special effects, I guess. But the idea that there's somewhere you can go where everything is so close to reality, it might as well not be. I mean, what does that mean? Are people going to get addicted to this to escape reality? How do you, you know, how do you know what's real and what's not? Um, is this like, is this where like now we're, we have virtual reality? So we've gone beyond. I mean, there's a lot of stuff working in here that I think is really really fascinating. And then I think the other aspect of the Uncanny Valley is that the robots look so much like people, sometimes they can't even tell who's like playing the game and who's a robot. Um, and then it, toward the end of it, you know, it becomes this kind of cat and mouse game between the gunslinger and Peter. Peter actually pretends to be a robot at one point, though he's found out because of the infrared, uh, the, 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 the enhanced audio and 
and the, the extra stuff the robot has, the infrared sight. Um, and then as he damages the robot, it becomes less and less human and more and more almost monster-like, but it was kind of monster-like the whole time. So and that continuum of what's real and what's not and desiring the thing that looks real, but also being terrified of or repulsed by the thing that's not real. I thought that that was really fascinating. And, and even the whole idea of the amusement park changes because the humans are having fun killing the robots and salting them, basically. And then the end is basically the robots almost like getting revenge, whether it's a, whether they're just refusing to follow their programming or it's an actual mechanical issue. So I think he's I think he's doing a lot with even like the nature of reality, even um, and the nature of how we interact with technology and what robots could even be. And thinking back on the '70s, that's also kind of anticipating things that I'm not sure was evident then. Would you say that the experience and the robots were more human than human, Mel? Because if I, <laughs> if I may borrow the tagline from Blade Runner there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were more human than human until their faces fell off. <laughs> well, as you were talking, I mean, I, that was... That was the the line that just jumped into my head, though, the, the more human than human line from uh, Blade Runner that was, of course, turned into a song later by White Zombie. But, um, I mean, Blade Runner, of course, based on a book by Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And, I mean, I really think Philip K. Dick might be one of my favorite sci-fi authors, partly because of his, like predictions and visions of the future a lot of them seem to be very spot on i'm gonna have to do some research on this because i don't want to sit here and, and say oh this was influenced philip k dick because i don't know that that happened but i can see some extreme parallels between uh westworld and blade runner or, or do androids dream of electric sheep so uh I think the Dick novel was first. I think it was the late '60s when that came out. Was it? I, I, I was just sure. googling that. I, I know the book was older was than the movie. The... Was it? Okay, um, so maybe yeah. maybe maybe Dick inspired Crichton a little bit. Either either way, um, yeah. For some reason, I had it in my head that the book was later, like like '78. But um, we're gonna trust what Google says because I, I also saw that. But. Um, <laughs> I uh, I mean, I just, I just can't help but think like Michael Crichton's thinking on like he he's tapping into the same sort of sci-fi overmind or, or whatever that Philip K. Dick was with this because I mean they're they're both very similar in that idea of and, and they don't really explore this in the the movie as as much as I'm imagining they may in the show, but the idea that there could be robots that don't realize that they're robots and think they're human and are living robot lives that they think are human lives. I mean, that's a very Philip K. Dick Blade Runner kind of thing there. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I, the, the parallels are really, really intriguing. And I had never really thought of Michael Crichton as on that same sort of, uh, same part of the continuum, I guess, as as Philip K. Dick in terms of the the predictions for the future and kind of ideas of of androids and where they have, uh, you know, wh where their humanity lies, I guess, on on the spectrum. I don't know. I'm, I'm starting to really lose my my thread here, but I don't know. I've, I've just kind of had this revelation of like. I always liked Michael Crichton, but I had him in my head as a different type of sci-fi writer. But I mean, this really is very, very aligned with Philip K. Dick, which I think is pretty fascinating. I think that is an excellent uh, comparison, and I will not say anything else other than please go watch the TV show. <laughs> I can tell you're you're trying not to spoil, and I do do appreciate that. 
I think before I do actually spoil anything that <laughs> maybe we should go ahead and call it into this episode. Uh, I'm really glad we did this. I'm really glad that we are talking about Michael Crichton, especially beyond just his Jurassic Park and his 90s work, which obviously we know uh, a lot about. Uh, that was kind of our introduction, as Matt was saying. But I hope that this... Um, this episode maybe inspired you to watch the original movie. I absolutely hope it inspired you to watch the TV show on HBO or Max or whatever they're calling it now. Uh, but that's it for today. We're at No Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we have a Facebook page, and you know what? We would absolutely love it if you guys would reach out and let us know your thoughts on Westworld, either the movie or the TV show. Our email is nofearcast at gmail.com. If you love what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon or simply rate and review us, which is entirely free for you, but it does help other listeners find us. The music is by Nicholas Gasparini. We'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.